stress of our world can take a toll on our physical and emotional health. Here, in New York's Catskill Mountains, lies a luxurious place of healing called Yo One Wellness Center. The Yo One Wellness Center provides half a million square feet of natural methods to manage diabetes, hypertension, chronic pain, obesity, depression, anxiety, and other conditions. We use the traditions of centuries-old natural science from India, yoga, Ayurveda, acupuncture, and naturopathy in personalized programs that help you take charge of your own health. A minimum five-day stay is recommended for best results. Book now at yoone.com. Welcome, you're watching Gravitas with me, Molly Gambhir. Here's a look at what's lined up for you on the show tonight. Tonight, our cover story comes from China. It is about the Great Wall. Not the Great Wall of China, but the Great Wall of Debt in the country. China's mounting debt is turning into a nightmare for the people on the ground. Chinese cities are struggling to pay bills. Experts are warning of socio-economic unrest. How exactly did things reach this point? Why has the President Xi Jinping failed to contain the crisis? We get the latest and decode this and more over the next few minutes. Also on the show for you tonight, is Russia planning a new offensive? The Ukrainian Defense Minister's statement has raised concerns over a new offensive as the war turns almost a year old. Australia has snubbed King Charles, dropping his picture from the $5 banknotes. We tell you why. Two years since the Myanmar military coup, we get you a detailed ground report. How much more repression can the people tolerate? A perfume bomb has been recovered in Jammu. What is a perfume IED? What is the latest from on the ground? Chinese scientists have successfully cloned three super cows that can produce an unusually high amount of milk. We tell you more. Our cover story is about China's new Great Wall, the Great Wall of Debt. A wall that has left the Chinese authorities banging their heads against it. Let's directly get to the numbers. According to a new Forbes report, China's overall debt, both in the public and the private sector, has risen to a colossal $51.9 trillion. I repeat, $51.9 trillion. That is almost three times the size of China's economy. And this number is truly staggering. If analysts are to be believed, matters are set to get even worse. They say that next year, 
that is 2024, China is set to sink further into debt. In fact, they predict a rise of 4 trillion yuan, that's equivalent to $570 billion. Just for the sake of perspective here, this debt far exceeds America's burden. As of December 2022, America's overall debt was around $31.4 trillion. China's relative debt burden is at least 40% higher than this. And if this doesn't highlight the precarious situation that China is in, then perhaps it's worth considering this report. It says due to the massive debt distress, Chinese cities are struggling to pay their bills. They are slashing wages, cutting public services and reducing the fuel subsidies. Where exactly are these uh, cities located? Mainly in these provinces. Heliongjiang, Hebei, Guangdong, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Honan. All of these provinces are struggling with mountains of debt. And the road to recovery is not visible, by the way. Let me begin with Hebei, a province that's located in northern China. Throughout the last three months of 2022, the people of Hebei had trouble heating their homes because of a shortage of natural gas. And why was there a shortage? Because of the lack of government subsidies. And why were the subsidies lacking? Because the authorities did not have enough money. Most of their financial resources got drained paying debts. And let me remind you, this is all according to China's own media houses, not the Western press. And next, we have Heliongjiang province, the northernmost province in China. Throughout the bitter month of January, households in the city of Hegang here were also left without heating services because local firms had severely restricted the supply. And why did they restrict the supply? Again, no subsidies. And then we have Honan and Guangdong provinces. In December last year, a number of cities in these provinces had to partially suspend the bus services. Why? Due to the budget constraints. And next, we have Zhejiang and Jiangsu provinces. Last year, they had to cut down public sector jobs or reduce the salaries, jobs that are considered to be the most secure in the country. The Chinese state media said, these provinces slashed pay in the public sector jobs by as much as 30%. And finally, we have Hegang, a city in Heilongjiang. It made history in mid-2022 by becoming the first city to undergo a fiscal restructuring. And why did it have to undergo this restructuring? Due to a grave debt distress. That's according to the state media. And there are many more accounts, but you get the point here. A death storm is stirring apart Chinese cities. It is a storm that has sparked socio-economic tensions and unrest. Tensions like the rare protests that we saw in 2022. They could make a comeback this year. As the Chinese citizens struggle with lower wages, vanishing jobs and shut businesses. The question is, what explains all of this? There are a host of reasons. Let's look at them one by one. Reason number one being exhausted budgets. Many local governments in China have completely drained their coffers by spending enormously on the lockdowns, mass testing, quarantine centers. This is a minefield of China's own making. Reason number two, lower revenue. As the Wuhan virus engulfed China last year, people reduced their spending to save money and this resulted in less tax revenues by the local governments. Furthermore, huge tax breaks were given to support the ailing businesses. And reason number three, the most important of them all, is the housing market slump. You see, home prices in China have been falling for 16 months straight. Land sales, which account for 40% of all the local government revenue, have also collapsed. I have a report with me. It's from last week. It says the sales of new residential properties in the country tumbled around 
28% last year. That's a five-year low. This graph tells you how. In 2018, the sales of new residential homes in China amounted to 12.6 trillion yuan. In 2019, this figure jumped to 13.9 trillion yuan. 15.45 trillion yuan in 2020. 16.2 trillion yuan in 2021. And in 2022, it fell to an abysmal 11.6 trillion yuan. And what does this tell you? That China's property bubble has burst. Its mighty real estate sector is crashing. For the unversed, this sector accounts for around 29% of the Chinese GDP. 29%. It accounts for a quarter of the domestic output. Almost 80% of the household assets. Around 100,000 companies operate in this sector. And this makes it the nation's second biggest employer, providing around 27 million jobs to the Chinese citizens. And all of this is now under threat, courtesy the whims of one man, Xi Jinping. Last year, he rolled out a host of measures to reduce excessive borrowing by the property companies. In other words, he tried limiting the debt to the developers. But when this debt was limited, many found it impossible to complete the projects and this set off a chain of events that triggered the real estate crash. And this same chain of events has now burdened the local governments with debt. The question is, what is China doing about this? And the answer is, nothing much. The leaders sitting in Beijing have said they will not come to the rescue, that they will not bail the local governments out. Their message to them is simple. It's your baby, you should hold it yourself. And this is exactly what China's Ministry of Finance said earlier this month. The Chinese governments, of course, don't have to face elections. It is a one-party dictatorship which cannot be overthrown by legal or constitutional measures. But for how long can the government shut down public anger with an authoritarian plug? For how long can it ignore the growing debt problem? For how long can it leave the local governments to fend for themselves? The Chinese citizens have started raising these questions with unpredictable consequences. Gautam Adani's companies have lost a staggering $107 billion in market cap in less than a week. Arguably one of the biggest crashes in Indian history. The rout saw most of the Adani company's stocks hit the lower circuit breaker almost on a daily basis, leading to personal wealth erosion of a whopping $57 billion. And in a late night announcement on Wednesday, the group said they will not go ahead with the follow-on public offer worth $2.5 billion, further spooking investors on Thursday. Gautam Adani issued a video statement earlier today defending the company's call. After a fully subscribed FPO, yesterday's decision of his withdrawal would have surprised many. But considering the volatility of the market seen yesterday, our board strongly felt that it would not have been morally correct to proceed with the FPO. But the group chairman's words did little to pacify the shareholders and they continued to dump Adani stocks. Adani Enterprises dived by 26.4%, Adani Green Energy by 10%, Adani Ports and SEZ by 6.55%, Adani Power by 5%, Adani Total Gas by 10%, Adani Transmission plunged by 10%, Adani Wilmar dropped by 5%. Only two Adani companies, Ambuja Cement and ACC, managed to reverse the trend. But the losses for Adani have still been massive. Besides, Citibank's wealth unit has said that it would no longer accept Adani bonds as collateral for marginal loans. 
This comes a day after Credit Suisse, an influential global investment banker, made a similar announcement. Who would have thought the blue-eyed boy of India, Inc., would have to take such a drastic step? But there seems to be no light at the end of the tunnel for Adani. India's central bank, the RBI, has now decided to look into the exposure that Indian banks have to the conglomerate as its debt-fueled expansion made Adani a market darling in the last few years. For what we know so far, Punjab National Bank's exposure to Adani firms is nearly $851 million. Bank of Baroda's exposure, exposure standing at $486 million. The State Bank of India is yet to reveal the figure. Meanwhile, India's state insurer, Life Insurance Corporation, has said it has over the years invested nearly $3.65 billion in Adani stocks. And the Hindenburg Adani saga also echoed in the parliament, with the opposition parties calling for a discussion. The opposition wants either a joint parliamentary probe or an investigation by a Supreme Court monitored panel. It says the savings of millions of Indians have been threatened by Adani's stock market route. And these savings lie in Indian PSUs, which have invested heavily in Adani firms. But their demand was rejected by the House speakers, leading to the adjournment of the proceedings. Gautam Adani, who at one point of time was the second richest man in the world, continues his slide down the list. He has now dropped to number 13 on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Let's now shift focus to Europe. In about three weeks from now, it will exactly be one year since the war in Ukraine started. One year of turmoil and destruction. The question is, what can one expect from this war as it completes one year? Will it subside or will it get worse? If we go by Ukraine's version, matters are set to get worse. In fact, it says Russia is planning a new offensive. An offensive which will begin on the 24th of February, the very day this war started last year. What makes Ukraine say this? We don't know. But we can tell you who has issued this warning. Oleksiy Reznikov, the defense minister of Ukraine. He says that Moscow has amassed thousands of troops and could launch a fresh and more belligerent offensive to mark the anniversary of its invasion last year. Is there any merit to his claims? Well, one can't say that for sure. But what is certain is that the fighting is slowly going back to pre-winter levels. In fact, last week, Russia conducted a series of airstrikes in Ukraine. This week, Ukraine responded with counter-strikes. Let me start with these images. They are from the Donetsk region. They apparently show an artillery strike near Bakhmut. It was conducted by the Ukrainian army. The target was a Russian military outpost. And shortly after this, the Ukrainian president issued a statement saying that it has started operations to make Russia retreat from the battlefield. Have a listen to this. Listen to this. Our defense and security forces, the Ukrainian government, our partners, we're all working together to ensure that Russia not only fails to win back on the battlefield, but that the occupier loses in its attempts for revenge. The last hope for aggression. So is Russia retreating? Not really. If anything, it is responding with more attacks. And one such attack unfolded in Kramotorovsk today. A Russian missile apparently destroyed an apartment building and damaged seven more in the vicinity. Visuals from the site showing rescue teams searching through the rubble and using cranes to lift parts of the collapsed concrete. Reports say at least one person died in this attack and 20 others were injured. What explains this spot in the attacks? I know the two sides are engaged in a war, but for the last few months, the war activity had slowed down. There were not many frequent exchanges of fire. Neither any major air raids or missile strikes. And now, all of a sudden, the war is inching back to how it started. Why is this happening? 
We know the weather is playing a role here. For the last two months, the fighting had died down due to the winter. Heavy snowfall led to a minor ceasefire of sorts. It halted operations on both sides. And now that the ice is melting and mercury is beginning to soar, so have the number of attacks and counterattacks. That is one reason. Another reason is the West's decision to send tanks to Ukraine. Russia says this will escalate the situation. It will be seen as the West's direct involvement in the war. And what's worse, there are reports that Ukraine could now get longer range missiles. The Kremlin says it has had enough of this, that if the missiles reach Ukraine, the tensions will, without any questions, escalate as well. Пока никаких планов по переговорам Путина и Байдена нет. У нас главная цель это продолжение специальной военной операции. Главная цель это выполнить наши задачи, которые были обозначены главой государства. And by the way, that's not the only warning that Russia has issued. The country's spy chief has also warned the NATO that its attempts to raise the stakes in this war are bound to fail that they will fail to inflict a strategic defeat. NATO is raising the stakes as they retain dreams of a so-called strategic defeat for Russia. But that is not going to happen. Meanwhile, the Russian foreign minister has taken a softer approach. He says Moscow wants this war to end. But for it to end, the West must stop its geopolitical games. It's stubborn line that things never come to a conclusion. Listen to this. From our point of view, the more effectively we explain what is happening in terms of geopolitical games, the sooner the world will begin to understand that this needs to end. And it needs to end when we see that they have stopped attempts too, not even attempts, but the persistent stubborn line from the West led by the United States to make sure this never ends. You see, Russia's message to the NATO is quite simple. You want some, come get some. But the question is, has this message reached the NATO? Has it reached the White House? It seems like it. In fact, reports say the U.S. president will visit Central Europe this month. What for? If we go by the remarks of the Polish president who made this announcement, it seems that the aim of the American president's visit will be to recalibrate the West's strategy on Ukraine to discuss how long this war can really go on for. I'll wrap the story with this statement. Ladies and gentlemen, we are of course expecting a visit by President Joe Biden for the very simple reason that it has been announced. The President will most likely be coming to our part of Europe in February. We here are ready to talk with our allies on the topic of support for Ukraine. But I will say once again, we help Ukraine but we also care about the security of the Republic of Poland. On to Australia now. It has decided to say goodbye to the Queen in its own way. It will replace the portrait of Queen Elizabeth II on its $5 banknotes. And this is bad news for King Charles III. After the Queen's demise, it was his chance to appear on these dollar bills. But you see, Australia has different plans. The country wants to honor its indigenous culture and history. It plans to design the new $5 banknotes featuring indigenous figures. The new bills will take several years to be designed and printed. The old ones will continue to be issued and exchanged in the meantime. The central bank's decision has been supported by the center-left government of Australia. It has also been welcomed by the aboriginal politicians and the community leaders. But at the same time, it has also rekindled the debate about republicanism in Australia. Some are lauding the change, while others are calling it a woke nonsense. You see, Australia has a complicated history with the monarchy. It still struggles to resolve its dark past and the crown's role in it. Although Australia is independent, it still remains a constitutional monarchy. 
with Charles, uh, King Charles III as its head of state. The role is li largely ceremonial, but it is symbolic of monarchs holding a position of power. So is Australia trying to assert its independence through this move? Voters narrowly chose to maintain the Queen as its head of state in a 1999 referendum. But the situation is quite different now. And the biggest reason behind that is the death of Queen Elizabeth. You see, she was considered to be the strongest bond between Australia and the royal family. King Charles does not enjoy the same affection or support. Many Australians do not like the idea of having an unelected king on their currency. That too in place of First Nations leaders and other eminent figures. A lot of residents also think that the head of the state should be an, an Australian, someone who belongs to the country, who is one of them, instead of a monarch with a dark history of colonialism. In fact, a recent survey by Oxpol suggests fewer Australians favour the status quo regarding the monarchy than in the past. 31% said they were in favour of retaining the monarchy. This was down from 54% in the last official referendum in 1999. The Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, is a long-standing Republican. He favours an eventual move to an Australian Republic. His centre-left Labour government pushes for a referendum to alter the constitution and the change would recognise indigenous people in the document. It would also let them have a say in decisions that affect their lives. And in such an environment, the decision to remove monarchs from $5 bank notes is being applauded. The Australian Republic movement is quite happy about it. But it has also triggered criticism. The absence of the monarch from the bill indicates a stealth government effort to impose republicanism on Australia. And Australia's right-wing opposition is calling this move an attack on the country's systems, society, institutions. Philip Benwell, the leader of the Australian Monarchist League, was even harsher in his criticism. In a statement, he implied that the Premier Albanese was working assiduously to topple King Charles, the allegations were disputed by the government. It believes that the decision would strike a good balance. And why is that? Because Australian coins already carry Queen Elizabeth's image. New coins will have the effigy of King Charles and first Australians will now be recognised on the $5 note. So it is a win for everyone. However, it is overlooking the fact that much of Australia's currency already features indigenous Australian figures and artworks. While Queen Elizabeth's portrait was only present on $5 bills. In September, Australia said the image of her successor would not automatically appear on the notes, meaning that no monarch would remain on Australia's paper currency. And this comes as many Australians still see the monarchy as an important symbol of stability. At the very heart of all of this are crucial questions about Australia's identity. According to recent estimates, First Nations people lived in Australia for at least 65,000 years before British colonisation. But when the Queen's reign started, Aboriginal Australians were not even counted as part of the population. The Queen's death last year already triggered many emotions. While many mourned her, others experienced a renewed sense of trauma. You see, they still carry the painful legacy of colonisation. The royal family played a huge role in their displacement. It inflicted violence on them. So the change in the currency design could be an empowering move for the first Australians. No matter how much the monarchists criticise this. Two years since the Myanmar military coup, the people of Myanmar continue to live in a nightmare. The world seems to have forgotten them and their own rulers are upending their lives. According to reports, the military junta has extended the country's state of emergency by another six months now. Where does this leave the promise of the elections, the promise of restoring democracy in the country? Our next report explores.
On the 1st of February 2021, Myanmar's military overthrew the democratically elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi and seized power in a coup. This marked the end of a decade of tentative political reforms following 49 years of strict military rule. Ever since that day, Myanmar has been in turmoil. The coup upended lives and led to widespread protests. As per the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners, 141 people were killed on the 27th of March 2021. This was one of the bloodiest days of violence since the coup. It estimates that 13,680 people are currently detained for their support of the pro-democracy movement since the coup. And more than 2,800 people have been killed in the violence. The junta disputes the reported number of casualties. According to the United Nations, some 1.2 million people have been displaced and over 70,000 have left the country. The ousted leader, Suu Kyi, was recently convicted of five counts of corruption and jailed for seven more years. The trials have been condemned internationally as a sham, designed to keep the junta's biggest threat at bay. The 77-year-old is held in a jail in the capital of Naipyeotso in solitary confinement. The military has insisted she received due process by an independent court. As per the US-based conflict monitoring group ACLED, around 19,000 people died last year as a crackdown on protests led many to take up arms against the military. Meet 21-year-old resistance fighter Aya Chan. He was a factory worker making instant noodles before the coup and now is a resistance fighter. Okay. My name is Ai Chan and I'm 21 years old. I was a factory worker in Yangon, but now I have become a revolutionist to be against the military regime till the ultimate fall of the junta. I never had a regret while I was fighting and when I got injured, I chose this route because I believe this route is the right one. If I recover enough, I will go back to the war. This is until the end. On the second anniversary of the 2021 military coup, protesters took to the streets in Thailand and Japan. Myanmar's junta has now extended the country's state of emergency by another six months. Junta leader General Menon Lein said multi-party elections must be held as the people desire, but did not provide a timeline for the polls, which cannot be held during a state of emergency. I don't think it is possible to do an election. Even if they do, it will be just themselves with their soldiers. Everyone locally and internationally has rejected them. Critics have said any elections are likely to be a sham aimed at allowing the military to retain power. Meanwhile, the United States and its allies imposed further sanctions on Myanmar on Tuesday. The same day, Britain sanctioned two companies and two individuals it said had supplied Myanmar's air force with aviation fuel used to carry out bombing campaigns against the country's own citizens. The UN Special Envoy at the United Nations has called it the second anniversary of the failure of the international community to effectively address this crisis. There's three things that the junta needs to sustain itself. It needs money, it needs weapons, and it needs uh, legitimacy. Um, the, the junta does, does not have legitimacy in the, in, in the eyes of the people of Myanmar. The question is, as the situation on the ground continues to worsen, how much repression can the people tolerate? Terrorists seem to be getting more innovative with each passing day. Let me tell you what happened in Jammu and Kashmir. The police there got hold of a perfume IED or an improvised explosive device. That's right, the Jammu and Kashmir DGP has said that the recovered IED is shaped like a perfume bottle. It would explode if anyone tries to open it. He called the undetonated IED as one of its kind. The police, in fact, say that they were learning more about the device. Let me read out a statement by the Director General of Police, Dilbak Singh. 
He has said, and I'm quoting, this is the first time we have recovered a perfume IED. We have not recovered any perfume IED before. The IED will blast if anyone tries to press or open it. Our special team will be handling this, will be handling that IED. The police arrested a government teacher for possessing the perfume IED. The teacher named Arif is allegedly an operative of uh, the proscribed terrorist group lashkar e -Toyba. He is suspected of planting IEDs, which led to twin blasts in Jammu's Narwal last month. The IED explosions took place at a transport yard near an army camp. The twin blast led to nine injuries. A total of three IEDs were delivered to Arif from Pakistan. The explosives were transported through a drone. The Indian agencies have already flagged the rising number of drone incursions from Pakistan. Drones have been used by Pakistan-based terrorists to transport IEDs, arms and drugs into India. While two of the IEDs were used in Narwal, the last remaining perfume IED remained in Arif's possession. What's more, the police say that Arif has ties to another LET operative. This operative is allegedly located in Pakistan and he was behind two recent deadly terror attacks. But it's really the potential use of a perfume IED which has caught the eye of the Indian agencies in this case. I would like to underscore here that an IED fashioned after a perfume has not been found anywhere else in the world till now. The IEDs first became popular during the Iraq war where the Iraqi insurgents and the terrorists deployed them to target the US and British forces. We have known of IEDs carried through vehicles or delivered in a package or simply concealed at road sites. IEDs have been delivered through a pipe bomb as well. But what was found in uh, Jammu and Kashmir is entirely new and make no mistake about it. By the very design, any sort of IEDs have the potential to inflict massive damage. Moving on for now, do you dread going to family functions? Is interacting with your relatives a task for you? Having endless small talks, facing private questions, which you know will attract raised eyebrows and judgmental looks perhaps. Well, we've all been there, done that. So what do you do to get out of such meetings? Maybe make up some excuse that you have urgent work or pending assignments to deal with. But what if you had the legal right to say no? I am not making this up. This has actually happened. Italy has come up with a ruling now which can get you out of meeting your relatives. Italy's top court says that an unwelcome and unwanted relationship cannot be imposed. And this includes children. They are now under no obligation to see their grandparents if they do not wish to do so. The ruling relates to a specific case in Italy. Grandparents of two children had appealed to the court that they were unable to meet them. And what was the reason? An ongoing conflict in the family. The relationship between both the pairs of adults was, was not good. Uh, amid that, the children did not wish to spend time with their grandparents. But the elderly couple did not take this well. And they filed a case in a lower court and the juvenile court in Milan. Their complaint was against the children's parents. The grandparents said that they were unable to spend time with the kids due to the obstacles created by the parents. The grandparents won in both the juvenile court and the Milan court of appeal. The judges ordered meetings between them and the children in the presence of a social worker. And they also warned that spending no time with their relatives could cause psychological distress to the children. But amid all this, they forgot a crucial thing. What do the children want? The court did not consider the children's consent and opinion in the whole matter. The parents argued that the meetings were not appreciated by the children. There was too much tension and conflict. They appealed to the Supreme Court to have the decision overturned and it turned out to be in their favor. The court said that children would not be forced to meet their grandparents. Now, don't get me wrong here. Spending time with their loved ones and relatives is absolutely crucial for children's emotional growth. It is important. They deserve to feel loved and connected. 
to enjoy wholesome food cooked by their grandmother, to listen to the anecdotes of their grandfathers. But that was not the case here. The children were distressed by the meetings because they were forced into it as per reports. It wasn't what they wanted and the court finally took that into consideration. It ruled that the interests of the children must prevail over those of the grandparents. Especially because they had reached the age of 12 and could decide for themselves. You see, it's a common error that adults make. They think they know the best for their child, which is true to a large extent. But under that assumption, they fail to listen to the child. And that is one of the reasons why children suffering from abuse are often silenced. But in this case, the parents listened and fought in the court. They did not let their child get forced into doing something against their will. Now, as we talk about parents knowing the best and children dumping their grandparents in a way, I have peculiar news for you. A Belgian couple abandoned their baby at an Israeli airport. What exactly happened? They were supposed to fly from Tel Aviv to Brussels. They had their newly born baby with them. But when asked to buy a ticket for the little one, the couple did not seem too keen. Instead, they left the baby at the check-in at the airport. They left the baby there. He was found near the conveyor belt at the check-in area by the airport staff. The crew members noticed what had happened and contacted the police. The parents were taken in for questioning. They were later detained by the police for abandoning their baby. Even the managers and the airport crew were shocked. And I'm guessing so are you. Now, my question is, was it an error made in hurry or did the couple deliberately abandon the baby? And we end the show tonight with a story that will make your eyebrows touch the ceiling. China has successfully cloned three super cows. Cows that can produce an unusually high amount of milk. This tr story is truly stranger than fiction. The question is, why does China need such super cows? You have to watch this report to find out. You may have heard of super soldiers, individuals capable of operating beyond normal human limits. You may have also heard of supercomputers, devices that can almost operate at the speed of light. But have you ever heard of super cows? Bovines that can produce unusually high amounts of milk. If you haven't, then brace yourselves for what we're about to tell you. Chinese scientists have successfully cloned three super cows. A bizarre invention the state media is hailing as a breakthrough. They say these cows will boost China's dairy industry and, not to mention, reduce its dependence on imported breeds. How exactly? We'll discuss that in just a bit. First, let's talk about the experiment. It was conducted by scientists at the Northwest University of Forestry Science in China's Shanxi province. The calves were cloned from highly productive cows of the Holstein Friesian breed. Holstein Friesians originated in the Netherlands and are said to be the world's highest producing dairy animals. The scientists made 120 cloned embryos from the air cells of these cows and placed them in surrogate cows. And after nine months, the three calves were born in the Ningxia region, just weeks before Lunar New Year. So what's so special about these calves? Well, to start with, they can produce 18 tons of milk per year, or around 100 tons of milk in their lifetimes. For the sake of perspective, this is nearly 1.7 times the amount of milk an average cow in the US can produce. 
Next question: How will these super cows help China? Well, as of last year, as much as 70% of China's dairy cows are imported from overseas, and only five in 10,000 cows in China can produce a hundred tons of milk in their lifetimes. So for China, this is truly a moo-tastic discovery, one it says will make the dairy industry self-reliant. Interestingly, this is not the first time China has cloned an animal. Last year, the Chinese company created the world's first cloned Arctic wolf. And in 2017, Chinese scientists said they produced cloned cattle with increased resistance to bovine tuberculosis. For now, China's biggest gift to the world remains the Wuhan virus. Bureau report: We on world is one. Let's now tell you what else made news around the world. Time for Gravitas Global Headlines. Pakistan should not put the blame for Peshawar blast on Afghanistan, says Afghan minister. This after Pakistan's interior minister had said that TTP takes shelter in neighboring country. Philippines grants United States access to four more military bases as the two nations seek to counter China's increasing assertiveness on Taiwan and in the disputed South China Sea. U.S. and South Korea hold joint air drills in response to threatening postures from North Korea. Pyongyang hits back, says the allies are pushing tensions to an extreme red line. The European Union plans to slap Russia with fresh sanctions by the anniversary of Moscow's invasion of Ukraine, including an additional price cap on Russian petroleum products. Israel carried out airstrikes on Gaza Strip hours after intercepting a rocket fired from the Palestinian territory. This, despite U.S. appealing both sides to restore calm. A Russian missile killed at least three people while injuring over 20 in an eastern Ukrainian city. The missile destroyed an apartment building and damaged seven others, according to regional police. Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky said, "This is not a replay of the past. This is the daily reality of the country." Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson urges world leaders to overcome reservations and send sophisticated defense systems to Ukraine. Landmark EU-Ukraine summit in Kiev tomorrow. Authorities are on high alert in Bolivia as Santa Cruz reported widespread cases of dengue fever. The surge has overwhelmed the country's health infrastructure. 69% of dengue cases in Bolivia are in Santa Cruz. In the last week, the infection rate has doubled to 697, according to local media. Rafael Varane has announced his retirement from international football at the age of 29. The Manchester United defender made his international debut in 2013 and won the World Cup with France in 2018, and was also part of the French squad that was beaten by Argentina in last year's final. Kylian Mbappe is a doubt for Paris Saint-Germain's Champions League clash against Bayern Munich later this month after injuring his knee during the 3-1 league win over Montpellier. The World Cup Golden Boot winner didn't have the greatest of nights and also missed a penalty that was taken twice. On that note, it's a wrap. We're ending this show, leaving you with Gravitas images as always. Thanks very much for watching.
जिंदगी में सिर्फ एक बार आता है उसे खुल के जीने दो दाग लगने दो दीवारों पर लगाए ना बर्जर इजी क्लीन पेंट नो दाग नो धब्बा ओनली ब्यूटीफुल वॉल्स जो मैला ना हो रंगों में वो क्या बचपन है जो झूमे ना हो मंगो में वो क्या बचपन है बचपन जिंदगी में सिर्फ एक बार आता है उसे खुल के जीने दो दाग लगने दो दीवारों पर लगाए ना बर्जर इजी क्लीन पेंट इसके क्रॉस लिंकिंग पॉलिमर